How's it going guys and welcome to Billy the Bat Boys Corner presented by Up On Game. I'm Billy Pinckney and today we have an exciting episode. We have Dre Jameson joining the show. We had him on a couple years ago back in 2020. At that time he was in the minor leagues with the Arizona Diamondbacks but this past season he made it to the big leagues and absolutely shoved. Did really really well against two playoff teams both the Padres and the Dodgers. So. We're going to get a little bit of an inside look into the progression that he made this past season in making it to the big leagues and why he was so effective. So without further ado, let's welcome Dre Jameson. All right, guys, we're here alongside Arizona Diamondbacks pitcher Dre Jameson. Dre, appreciate you hopping back on. No problem. Yeah, well, it's been a, what, man, a couple of great years for you. Last time we spoke was in 2020 after that whole mess there. And uh, it, since we last spoke, you made your major league debut. Great to see. I'd love to, for you to just take us through your last season in 2022. You started, I believe, in double-A, then ascended throughout the level of double-A AA and triple-A and made it to the big leagues. So, I mean, how exciting of a year was it for you and just to finally get that call up? You know, getting the call late in the year was definitely a relief. Um, but I mean, starting off, starting off the year, I started off really hot. Um, my first game wasn't so good. And then I bounced back, pulled together a lot of good starts. Then I got promoted to triple A, struggled a lot in triple A, um, but was really starting to just work on stuff while I was there. I kind of threw not the competing aspect out of it, but through throwing the results out of it and just diving in on what I need to work on. And, um, you know, the whole time I was in triple A, I might have had a couple good starts here and there, but for the majority it was, they were like rough when you look at it on paper. Um, but if you're at the game, it's, you'd be like, wow, that's just unlucky. A lot of unlucky scenarios that happen. Um, ballpark is just, it's hitter friendly for sure. And um, that's what taught me how to really, really pitch is to you got to locate these pitches in certain areas so you, the damage is less when, you know, hard contact and stuff like that. Um, so I had to really start relying on my sinker. Well, my sinker was always my pitch that I needed that ground ball. Well, I wasn't getting the movement on the sinker in Reno that I was in Amarillo and what I was getting when I got called up to the big leagues. Um, and, and same with all my pitches. I mean, my carry was down in Reno. My slider wasn't breaking as much in Reno. It, it just – Reno plays a lot different than a lot of other different places. Um, so I had to buy into that and throw the results out and just work on my craft and try to master it for when my time was called upon to go to the big leagues. I, I take what I've done, I don't change anything, and I go and I compete, and that's what I did. Did you have any trouble adjusting to that ball in AAA? Because that's the big league ball, right? Just a different stamp? Yeah, so um, we had big league balls in AA as well. Oh, okay. In the beginning of the year, we were using the pre-tacked um, like test balls. Right. So my first start, I was struggling with that. I finally got it down in my next bullpen, figured it out. This thing's moving a lot more than it usually does because of the pre-tax stuff. Um, and then I got the call to AAA, and I thought I was throwing cue balls. I mean, it was – these things were slipping. I couldn't get a grip of it because I was used to these pre tacked balls. Um, and then when I got back – and then when I got up to the big leagues, uh, balls were rubbed up properly to where, you know, you just lick your fingers and you're going to have a little bit of a stick and good feel of the ball. Um, when you're up there. Well, you mentioned you were pitching better than what the numbers shown, and obviously the Dimebacks saw that, and they promoted you to the big leagues. Were you surprised considering the numbers on paper might not have been there, but obviously you were confident in your ability to, to make things happen at the big league level? I mean, I was definitely – it wasn't that I was shocked, but if you if I had to bet on myself and um, to get that call that year, I probably wouldn't have done it just for the simple fact of I wasn't producing, I wasn't showing them. I might, my stuff might have played for them, but numbers-wise and what other people are basically saying, as such as hitters, um, showed that my stuff probably didn't play. And, and that's what I had a hard time taking a grasp on is 
I make a good pitch and, I, and it gets hit and it gets hit hard. And I'm like, what the heck? You know, like there's so many times you tip your caps to hitters, but I felt like I would have had to do that every single at bat that I faced someone down there. Um, and, and it was just, it's, it's a, it's a live and you learn. And that's where I kind of got, you know, more mentally uh, focused in on things is, at the end of the day, your numbers only really matter when you get to the big leagues. When you're in the minor leagues, you're developing. You're still you're still working on your craft to then be able to master that piece when you get to the big leagues. And um, that's what I did. I ran with it. And when I got to the big leagues, my sinker was moving. My slider was moving. My changeup was working. Heater had some carry on it. And curveball had some bite. So, um it all feeds off and plays. And on top of that is I think the big leagues brings out the best of your ability in, in playing the game. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the mental side right there. And, you know, when you're throwing that pitch that you feel like is really well executed, but the hitters are still squaring it up, how do you mentally navigate that? I mean, how difficult is it? Are you able to have conversations with the pitching coaches and maybe they're able to really help you out when it comes to that situation? Yeah, so it's, it's like when it boils down to when someone really – like got you um you look at location and then you go back and you look at the scouting report and it's like now we said that he doesn't hit fastballs up in the zone when it's one two or oh two or three two and i got it there but m maybe i left it a little too much in the zone rather than getting above the zone for him to swing and miss um Little things like that that you, you go back and you look at the scouting report and you're like, well, I mean, it adds up. Like, I'm not getting that extra zip to get it to the top of the zone to maybe get a foul ball to change his eye level. But if I'm hanging stuff, and a lot, of, it's not free swingers in AAA by any means, but there's guys swinging and they don't necessarily, they have an approach, but they don't have a big league approach. Because you face a big league hitter. They're looking in one spot, and as soon as you mess up, they're going to make you pay for it. Um, so it's really diving in, knowing the scouting report, and knowing what this specific guy's good at, and that's probably what he's going to look for. So you don't run away from your strengths, but you take your strengths and you go to his weaknesses, and you just you hammer it, and that's what I've I did towards the end. Um, and, and just the success in, in Reno, it's, like I said, on paper, it might not look good because it will be four four shutout innings and then the fifth inning I get blown up on and then the next inning it's a shutout. Well, when you look at the stat line, it's six innings, five runs, da 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 Well, if you break it down in a baseball form, okay, if I had to fix this, 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 and this in the fifth inning, it probably would have been another zero. So it's it's the it's the learning aspect of knowing the game and knowing the situations you're in um, when you're on the mound. Well, then you got you said you got called up to the big leagues and just dominated. I mean, it's did you look at that as a clean slate for you getting called up and you you got this boost of confidence that hey, you know I'm I'm able to do this. I'm in, at the big league level and the team has confidence in me to do my thing. I always believe in myself. Um, there's nothing that I don't think I can do if I put my mind to it. And, um, yeah, I mean, when I was on the mound, the guy in the box is doing the exact same thing as I'm doing. You know, we're out here trying to provide for the family, have fun, and, and everything under the sun. So, at the end of the day, I'm here and you're here. What's, there's no difference in my eyes. Yeah, your name might be more known than mine. That's completely fine. I don't care. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm on the bump. You're in the box and we're competing, so we're going to see who's going to win. And it was no easy task for you. I mean, you had to face the San Diego Padres in your debut, the L.A. Dodgers, and then the Giants twice. Made four starts, 1.48 ERA, really, really solid. Going into that first outing against the Padres, how did you approach them? They had some, they got some dudes in that lineup in the trade, with Juan Soto, Josh Bell, and all these other guys. So how did you go into that uh, approach of, of facing them? Just getting ahead. Um, and I, and I took that approach to even the Dodgers and the Giants. Um, you get ahead and good things happen. 
um, then, then you make a hitter uncomfortable. But when you fall behind and you're not landing certain pitches, they, they will eliminate those pitches to, you know, one or two pitches rather than a five pitch, pitch mix. They'll eliminate it. Um, so my success up there was really just getting ahead of guys. And, for instance, like you asked about the Padres, my first outing, I relied on a fastball and a sinker a lot. Um, and I didn't really want to run away from it. And I didn't feel like I necessarily had to do anything else because I wasn't getting hurt on it. So it's like, if, if you haven't proven to me that you can hit this, then I'm not going to go away from it until you prove to me that you can hit this pitch. Um, and with them, that's what I did. I relied on a sinker a lot. Machado almost got me. Um, Reno is definitely a homer, but, and I thought it was going off the bat. Um, <clears throat> but it, it's just, from low A to the big leagues, you get ahead of guys, you get ahead of hitters, you will succeed. And you did that too with Juan Soto. I mean, you struck him out your first your first major league strikeout, dotted a 98-mile-an-hour fastball in the inner half. Did you think you got him when you first threw that pitch? Because he was walking to first base thinking it's a walk. Yeah, I mean, there was a full ball in the zone. <laughs> um, <laughs> but. I mean, you know, it is it is what it is. Um, it's cool that it was my first strikeout, but uh, I'll see the guy a lot more. You throw very hard. I mean, not a huge pitcher in terms of height, not a guy who's 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, so I feel like you create a lot of leverage using your legs and your lower body as well. Is that something that you really try to work on? In the off season, I'm I'm really grinding my legs, trying to get them strong as I can because I know when it's time to – season is your legs are where all your power is your arm can be as fast as you can be as big as you want up top but if you want to get full velocity command direction to home plate it all comes from your lower half um and that's what i rely on and in high school i went to a pitching pitching instructor or whatever you want to call them but um we got lessons and He's actually a scout for the White Sox, Justin Wexler. Um, and, and he really bought in and told me basically, hey, we need to get your lower half going. Like, you got to learn how to use your lower half because I was all upper body. And then once I learned that, it just stuck with me. And then over the years, I've just progressively gotten better at, you know, loading into my backside and really driving down mound. Um, and, and I think that's – on top of my lower half, I have a really fast arm, so I think that's what generates a lot of the, the velocity. So how, how do you think you're going to then fit into their plans come 2023 with the opening day? You know, I I don't know because I'm not, I'm not the GM or anything, but all I know is I'm going to go in there and we'll be ready, um, and, and I'm going to compete for a spot. and. Whatever happens, happens. And if, if it's in the big leagues, great. If it's not, I'll be there soon because I'm not – I'm going to do everything I can to get back up to the big leagues. Um, but, yeah, as of right now, I don't I don't know. Um, but I would like a starting spot on that opening day roster. For sure, for sure. And it seems like a pretty young squad. I mean, a team that's, you know, coming back from rebuilding and really bringing up some of their – their young talent, and but one guy there was Madison Bumgarner. What were you able to take away from him? He's a hilarious dude, very funny guy. Um, didn't really talk to him much, but the times that I talked to him, he, he just talks, you know, about his time playing the game, um, and, and little things like that. It's it's not necessarily talking baseball and talking shop in the clubhouse when when we're around because we're all there, we're all doing the same damn thing. So it's – there wasn't really much um, baseball talk or things like that, just also because we're two totally different pitchers. Um, and and his body works totally different than what, how my body works. Um, but great guy, hilarious, um, fun to be around. Now, you were called up later in the year, but was there any type of rookie hazing or dress-up day that you guys had – yeah, so we, uh, after a game one day, we all dressed up in cow suits 
blow up cow suits. And um, we had to wear that the whole flight um, to, I think we were going to Houston. And then we had to get off the bus like a block away from the hotel. We just had to walk and we thought it was the funniest thing ever. Um, we got a couple pictures of some people on the side of the road um, just walking to the hotel, but it, it was fun. It was nothing too serious and it was a fun thing to do. Love it. I know you're pretty big into some custom gear yourself, right? You got your own brand and, and things that you rep? My, my brand is just a... I don't, I don't really have any clothing line out yet on it. Um, thinking about starting it up, <clears throat> kind of have some sketch outs and stuff I want to do. Um, made some hats a couple months ago. Um, I got them. They weren't that good. So I just kind of put them up in the closet and just back home in Indiana. I just don't want those ever to go out because then that's a bad look on my logo. Those hats in the world. Um, but, I mean, we have some – I'm going to start making some shirts, um, some shorts, more of like just your casual casual wear stuff, and then I want to dive into the golf side of it with my own brand because um, I'm, I'm kind of getting into golf a lot, um, you know, in this off season because I play, you know, two, two times a week roughly during season, um, and then outside of season I'm golfing every day. Um, so got some deals. Um, I work with mirror golf now, um, and just trying to, uh, maybe have a future plan for after baseball. Yeah, for sure. I know you're big into custom cleats too, right? You had those SpongeBob ones one time in, in the minor leagues. Yeah. Those were sick. So how'd that come about? When the whole little band thing came up of the cleats and stuff where you can basically wear whatever you want i thought it would be cool because i've always been in the shoes so i was like i'm just gonna get creative like you know a lot of people are gonna customize their shoes to like colors and scheming like the the color schemes of this and this and this and i was like i want to go like exotic on it i want to do you know my favorite cartoon and little things like that like i'm into you know, a little bit of fashion and designer stuff. So I have a pair of New Balances that just the N on the New Balance is Dior. And then I have two pairs of SpongeBob cleats. Um, I have a pair of Louis Vuitton cleats. I have some Cause cleats. I have my hometown cleats. Um, I have my Rick and Morty turfs. I have my Amarillo or Hillsboro to Amarillo cleats that I finished out the year. Not not this past year, but the year before. Um, and and I got a lot more in the making. Do they let you wear them at the big league level? Oh, I did. You did. I, I, I won. Yeah. What did yeah. your teammates say about it? Your teammates love them. Oh yeah, they think it's hilarious. <laughs> awesome. Hey, I got to ask: Do chains add velo? They got to add something, right? Do chains add velo? When well, chains add swagger, when you feel swagger, you might throw a little harder. Everybody. I don't know if they technically add velo. <laughs> That's good philosophy. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Dre, I appreciate you hopping on. Thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you. hopefully we'll see you out here at City Field at some point. Go see you. Yeah, for sure. We'd like to thank you for tuning into this episode of Billy the Bat Boys Corner, presented by Up On Game. Another great interview with Dre Jameson. Great to have him back on the show. Exciting to see his insight and, and what he's been up to this past season. Uh, great to see him absolutely dominate the big league level, and hopefully he'll be on the opening day roster for the Diamondbacks in 2023. If you'd like to learn more about what we're doing here with Billy the Bat Boys Corner and Up On Game, be sure to follow on social media at Billy the Bat Boy, at Up On Game Network. And we're supporting the Father English Center in Patterson, New Jersey, giving back to the community and helping out the young ball players out there. Appreciate you joining us, and we'll see you next time here on the show.